Hello and welcome to this clip on cyclohexene um, in the context of aromatic chemistry. Um, this is intended to be something that's looked at to review the, part, the, the first part of your aromatic learning uh, because we need to understand a little bit about cyclohexene or review a little bit about cyclohexene before we can fully appreciate what's going on with benzene. So we'll start with a quick review of cyclohexene as an alicyclic alkene together with a comparison of its reactivity with that of benzene. And then we'll go on to look at a more applied question on this topic. So throughout, this clip assumes knowledge of benzene's structure. So if we take cyclohexene, obviously what it is is a, a cyclic six-membered carbon ring, and it has one double bond in one particular location. Generally, for convenience, it's put on the right-hand side, but there's no particular reason it has to be there, as long as there's only one of them. So the key point here is that the electrons here, there's more of them in a double bond than there are in a single bond. There's twice as many, in fact. So it means that this is an area of electron density. And it's important to remember that it's considered to be localised. So in other words, the electron density stays within the carbon-carbon double bond. So this means that two atoms can possibly add onto the carbon-carbon double bond at the positions pointed to by the blue arrows. So to do the electrophilic addition mechanism, we start off by drawing our electrophile nearby to the point at which it will um, add onto the molecule, namely the carbon-carbon double bond. So I've, I've shown a bromine atom, or for a bromine molecule, beg your pardon, and I've put the dipole in. So what happens is, as you know, the curly arrow comes off the carbon-carbon double bond, it has to actually be touching the carbon-carbon double bond onto the delta-positive bromine. That allows the bond between the two bromine atoms to break and an electron pair, the bonding pair, to move onto the uh, delta-negative bromine atom. So you now have a bromide ion, which is what used to be the delta-negative bromine in the top part of the diagram. It's now picked up two electrons from the bromine-bromine bond. So now it acts as a nucleophile. Now, this is electrophilic addition, so the original electrophile is your bromine molecule. So now what it does is you draw from between the two electrons in the lone pair. It must start between the two electrons in the lone pair. An arrow, a curly arrow, onto the carbon that is positively charged. So basically the positively charged species called a carbocation. And your final product is your dibromo, 1,2-dibromo cyclohexane. So the key point to remember is the localised nature of the area of electron density in carbon-carbon double bonds allows it to attract or polarise electrophiles, for example, bromine. Hence we call it electrophilic addition. So when looking at whether a double bond is delocalized or not, let's look at cyclohexene as an example. You can see that if you draw the pi bonds above, the pi orbitals above and below the carbons where the double bond is involved, you can see that they also overlap. And because of this, cyclohexene, the double bond in cyclohexene will undergo electrophilic addition with things like bromine or chlorine, for example. But in benzene, the pi orbitals overlap sideways all around the ring, as you can see, so the six electrons in the pi system are completely delocalized. This means that benzene is resistant to electrophilic addition compared to cyclohexene. So the first one shouldn't be any trouble. So we're asking you to name alkene number one. And uh, as you can see, it's cyclohexene. However, in alkene number two, and alkene number three, you've got two double bonds, haven't you? But they're in slightly different places. So if alkene number two is 1,3-cyclohexadiene, let's have a think for a second where the 1,3 comes from. All it is really is the number on the, of the carbon on the ring where the carbon, carbon double bond starts. So if number 2 is 1,3-cyclohexadiene, why don't you pause the video and see if you can work out what number 3 is before resuming.
So hopefully you got it as one fourth cyclohexadiene. So it's worth pointing out at this point, it doesn't really matter which carbon happens to be number one, as long as relative to it, carbon number four is three carbons away, like that. So you could start carbon number one on any of the four places where there's a double bond, but just make sure you count around. So the next one says, to complete the following equations for the complete hydrogenation, it's really worth thinking about what complete hydrogenation is. It means every single carbon-carbon double bond in the structure has hydrogen added onto it. So you'll see that each of the equations has H2. That's because the H2 molecule will add on to the two carbons and therefore you'll get a hydrogen atom added on to each carbon. So you need to think to yourself, how many hydrogen atoms do I need? And therefore you can work out how many hydrogen molecules that will give you. So in each case you get cyclohexane because all of the carbon-carbon double bonds will be turned into carbon-carbon single bonds. The only way that could happen is if the right number of hydrogen atoms were added onto them in the form of H2. So because there are two carbon-carbon double bonds in the second one, I'll just highlight them very quickly for you, there and there, but there's only one carbon-carbon double bond in the first molecule, then in that case you only need one hydrogen, so I left it blank. You need two hydrogens in the second one because you need four, sorry, two hydrogen molecules because you need four hydrogen atoms. So just to draw in the actual molecules again, the little products, you have cyclohexane in each case. So I'm going to move the page down a little bit so we can start looking at the next part of the question. So the next bit says, use the molar enthalpies of hydrogenation, shown in B, to draw what conclusions you can. Now think about what conclusions you can actually means. All that's talking about is what you can actually deduce from that information. It doesn't mean you can necessarily find it in a textbook. It means what you can deduce from the information here. So it talks about the carbon atoms or the bonding between the carbon atoms, rather, in alkene 2. So let's have another look at what alkene 2 actually is, to remind ourselves. Alkene 2 is 1,3-cyclohexadiene. Um, so you actually have the carbon-carbon double bonds quite close to each other. the molar enthalpies there. So because it's quite a difficult part of the question, it's not that easy to work this out. There's four marks. And there's obviously four things to say. So if the pi orbitals in each carbon-carbon bond in alkene 2 were localised, in other words they were completely independent of each other and there were not, there was not any sense of the electrons moving around the ring. Let me try and illustrate what I mean for a second. I'm going to do this down at part D. So you can see how the curly arrows in the diagram at the bottom show the electron pairs moving around the ring a little bit. If that was happening, then that would change the enthalpy of um, the hydrogenation. So let's get rid of those curly arrows just for a second. And go back to the idea that the pi orbitals in each carbon-carbon bond, carbon-carbon double bond, rather, in alkene 2, were localised, then the enthalpy of hydrogenation would be simply twice 119.6. Like that. Now obviously, it's not twice that, it's slightly less. So what must be happening is that it's slightly more stable. It would have been minus 239.2 .2, because that's 119.6 times 2. I should really say minus 119.6 times 2. 
So, in other words, if they were completely localized, it would be minus 119.622 or minus 239.2 kilojoules per mole. It's actually 7.5 kilojoules less than this, so there must be some partial delocalization causing extra stability in the same way that delocalization in benzene causes its enthalpy of hydrogenation to be less than you would you'd expect it to be. So let's now move the question down a bit. It says, how would you expect the lengths of the carbon-carbon double bonds? Or rather, the carbon-carbon bonds in alkene 2 to compare with one another. So there's obviously two types of bonds, isn't there? There's a carbon-carbon single bond, and there's carbon-carbon double bonds. So to enable you to do this, for your next four marks, they're labelling each of the bonds individually as A, B, C, D, E and F. Like so. So bonds A and C will be shorter because they're obviously the double bonds. They have stronger attraction between the bonded electrons and the nuclei of the, of the bonded atoms. But D, E and F will be a little bit longer because they're carbon-carbon single bonds. And bond B in between is where the partial delocalization of pi electrons will occur. So you'll get an intermediate bond length between carbon-carbon double bonds and carbon-carbon single bonds. Exactly what Kathleen Lonsdale found when she did X-ray crystallography of methyl benzene. Um, carbon carbon bond lengths are identical around the benzene ring and also they are uh, in between the length of a carbon carbon single bond and a carbon carbon double bond. Now I'm just going to slightly improve my answer to part C. The way I've improved it is I've talked about the partial delocalization of the pi electrons. So I've just added uh, this little bit in here. Okay, now finally it said, estimate with reasons the molar enthalpy of hydrogenation of alkene 3. So looking at alkene 3, just to remind ourselves, it's a slightly different version, it's an isomer of alkene 2, isn't it? So the carbon-carbon double bonds are opposite each other, as opposed to slightly closer together. They're in the 1 and 4 positions instead of the 1 and 3 positions. So moving it back down, we know what the molar enthalpy for one carbon-carbon double bond is, 119.6. So this time you should be coming up with minus 239.2, because the pi bonds within each carbon-carbon double bond are too far apart to overlap. So admittedly this was quite an applied question, but it's good to make you think about it because it really does open up your understanding of the idea of delocalization. And just to have a quick look at the mark scheme. I'll leave the video clip playing for a minute or so, just to enable you to have a little look at it. If you wanted to rewind at this point back to the question, it's absolutely fine, obviously. might be worth pointing out that in question number uh, question part C there's a maximum of four marks because there are five possible things you could say to apply your knowledge of the delocalization uh, that can happen between nearby pi bonds in benzene and applying that to cyclic dienes like this. So cyclic diene, obviously remember, is something like that that has two carbon carbon double bonds in separate places on the ring. Okay, 